Hello! So today I want to tell you about how I failed to solve the 3x plus 1 problem, or the Collatz conjecture. I think it's an interesting story, so why don't we go ahead and talk about it some. If you follow YouTube mathematics, and let's face it, you're here, so you probably do, then you're probably aware that the YouTube channel Veritasium published a video on the 3x plus 1 conjecture, and in the subsequent month, we have seen a flurry of amateur mathematicians taking a shot at this problem. Now, most of these people aren't going to be able to solve the problem, and in fact, nobody can. But what this does is it allows a lot more people to access the bit of mathematics that mathematicians love, and that is the chase of a problem. And so even though most of the people are going to be hitting well-trodden paths, they're going to get an experience of trying out mathematics. And this is absolutely amazing. So what I want to tell you about today is my own walk through these well-trodden paths and tell you about what I did back when I was an undergrad. The 3x plus 1 problem is tantalizing because it looks very simple, and there's always a hope that maybe you can make some important contribution that nobody else has. So why don't we go ahead and get started. So when I was an undergrad, I had the idea that I would take on the Collatz problem. And the Collatz problem, or the Collatz conjecture, is a problem that involves a collection of sequences. And the sequences you make from integers, where you start with an integer n, and if that is odd, you multiply by 3 and you add 1, and if it's even, you divide by 2. And so, for instance, if we were to start with 3, 3 would map to 10, would map to 5, would map to 16, would map to 8, to 4, to 2, to 1. And then, if you were to apply the same idea to 1, then 1 maps to 4, then to 2, then to 1 again. And that ends up in a 1, 4, 2 cycle. The Collatz conjecture is that given any integer that we start with, if we create this sequence, then we should always terminate in a 1, 4, 2, 1 cycle. And this has been an unsolved problem for decades. And as an undergrad, I thought I would be the one to actually resolve it. But if you've seen Veritasium's 3x plus 1 video, you know that that didn't happen. But I did learn a lot on the way. You see, it turns out that if you were to represent a number in, say, a binary, and then to apply this Collatz rule to it, then when you multiply by 3, it's the same as shifting a number over in binary and then adding that number back. And then after that, you would just add 1, which is always going to end up putting an extra 0 at the very beginning. And from this perspective, the Collatz problem, the objective, is to end with a number that is represented as 1 in binary and followed by zeros all the way after. That means that it's a power of 2, and then you just keep dividing by 2 until you get down to 1. Then I realized that if a number actually does satisfy the Collatz conjecture, then if you save all of these operations that you did using this Collatz rule, and you end up with 1 on the other side, then you can go ahead and invert it. You can multiply by 2, subtract 1, divide by 3, and just keep iterating that until you get back to your original number. And ultimately, it gives you a representation of an integer as this. And so then I realized that we, instead of talking about the Collatz conjecture and sequences, we actually have a representation of integers. So I took this to my number theory professor, and I shortly thereafter found out that this was already discovered 10 years before I was born. And so what did I do then? Well, I did what any good mathematician does, and I pivoted. So I realized that I can get a very similar problem if I were to change it from being about even and odd numbers and divisibility by some arbitrary number k. So the idea is this. If a number is divisible by 2 by the class problem, we divide by 2. And if it isn't, then we multiply by 3 and then we add 1. If I want to do the same thing for an arbitrary k, I could look and ask, is it divisible by k? Then divide by that. But if it's not, I would like to multiply it by something to make it bigger, but not change its residue or remainder with respect to k. So instead, I multiply by k plus 1. And then I add k minus r, where r was the remainder of the original number. And this gives us a similar problem, where every other term is going to be divisible by k. So then we can build up exactly the same structure and, you know, etc. Of course, this ends up being more general than the Collatz problem. So if you solve this, you certainly solve the Collatz problem. But this generality didn't really buy me anything. And uh, yeah. I was just an undergrad trying to take a shot at 
the Collatz problem or the Collatz conjecture. And yeah, as you imagine, I didn't really get that far, but it was a fun problem to work on while I was an undergrad. And yeah, it gave me an experience that some problems are genuinely hard, which was a nice thing to take into graduate school where I would look at things that were maybe a bit more manageable. All right, so uh, if you like this story, then yeah, please subscribe and I would like to see you come by again. And uh, yeah, until next time, have a great day.